This is a video I've been wanting to make for a little while now, going right back to very basics and looking at the type of equipment that we need for brewing. But I haven't really been able to figure out the right way to do it, and I still haven't got it figured out, but I need to get this video up because it's important information for people who are just starting out in home brewing. So I'm just gonna make the video. I'm going to put it up and let you guys decide whether it's any good or not. The most basic form of brewing is extract brewing. That's where you get a tin of malt extract and either a pouch of liquid malt extract or dry malt extract and you mix those with water, you put them into a fermenter, you pitch your yeast in there, you leave it for a couple of weeks, come back and then at the end of that couple of weeks it, the yeast is finished making beer for you. The beer then goes into your bottles with some carbonation drops. You screw the lid on tight and that's it. Wait another couple of weeks and you've got lovely fresh beer. Like I say, that's the easiest form of brewing. That's the easiest that it gets. So this type of kit is ideal for that. And there are a number of kits on the market. I've already done an unboxing and a video on making this kit. The beer itself is sitting in my cupboard at the moment. I'm going to test it soon and see if it's finished fermenting. And if it has, then I go on to the next step. And you'll see that as well. But in its most basic form, this kit is the simplest type of equipment you can have. But where do we go from there? You've done a few of these and you now want to step up and Make your brewing your own, not just something that you're turning out from a tin, but you actually want to have some say in to how the flavours turn out in the end. What do you do? What equipment do you need? Well, I'm glad you asked. This may look like a lot, but just follow me for a second. We've got a stock pot here for mashing our grains in. So what we're going to do is steep them and treat them like a bit of a tea bag. What we want to do is get, all, get the hot water in there amongst the grains, let the enzymes from the malted grains start to work on the starches and convert them into sugars. And then we take the bag out and drain it and we're left with lovely malty sugar water. Now, all of this here is going to make a four litre or one gallon batch in this tiny, tiny little fermenter. Now, I've done a review on this fermenter before as well, so you can check that out. Let's open this up. This arrived the other day because my old grain bag was too manky for YouTube. And this is a good kit because it comes with a temperature strip as well. So I can take that temperature strip and stick it. Well, this one's already comes with it, but if I had a fermenter that didn't have a temperature strip, I could stick it on there and that's quite handy. So this is our grain bag. It's quite large. It's meant for dealing with fairly large grain bills. A grain bill, there's a term. Grain bill is just the grains that you put into your mash. So you put your grains in here, tie it up, plonk it in the warm water, round about, you want your strike water, another term that you'll need to know. Strike water is the water that you heat up to put the grains in. It needs to be around about 70 degrees. Your recipe will tell you what the strike water temperature needs to be. But generally it's around 70 degrees. And you want your mashing temperature to be, again, dependent on the, the recipe that you're using and the flavour profile you want to get out of the grains. It's generally between 65 and 67 degrees. So we've got our grain bag with the grains in our stock pot. How do we know the water's 70 degrees? Well, we've got a thermometer. 
Now this thermometer is meant for something a bit bigger than the stock pot, but it's a good example. I mean, you could use a meat thermometer, you could use a candy thermometer. They've all got temperatures on them as well as, you know, what the meat thermometer will tell you what temperature your, your beef needs to be at or your pork. But they do have temperatures on them and you can just sit it in your water to get a reading. Yep, that's 70 degrees, time to put the grains in. And then when you're mashing, you can just keep checking every now and again to make sure that you're keeping that temperature, that 65 to 67 degrees temperature. So we take, at the end, we take the grains out and we get as much of the water out of the grains as we can. We take the grains and my chooks love that. They get that as a treat as well as the horses. And the next stage in brewing is the boil. Now the boil serves two purposes. Firstly, it's going to kill off any microbes that might have made their way into your mash. And the second is, that's when we add our hops and the hops give additional flavour to the beer. So they balance the sweetness of the malt with a little bit of bitterness and a little bit of aroma and flavour of their own. And for that, we use a hop bag. Again, we use a bag so that we don't end up with a lot of hop material at the bottom of our boiler when we're done. We can simply take the bag out, just let it drain. We don't want to squeeze too much out of this because it, it will affect the flavour of your beer. You let it just drain out, put it aside, and then once you're done with your boil, you let things cool down. So there's obviously a fair bit more equipment than that here. So what's all this used for? Well, these are our cleaner. This is a sodium percarbonate based cleaner. And this is our sanitizer. It's a no rinse foaming sanitizer. So they're mixed up to clean everything and make sure everything's clean and sanitized before we start to use it. We obviously want to get rid of as many microbes and wild yeasts and things like that from the environment before we start. So that's what they're used for. We've got our, what's now called a wort because it's the, the extract from the malt and the hops. It's boiled off and we put it into usually a, a cold water bath or an ice bath to cool it down quickly. And then it goes into our fermenter. Now, because I'm only doing a small batch with this, it won't take much to fill it up. Wort goes in there, yeast goes in there, lid goes on top. I need to get a bung that fits there or drill that out a little bit because my bungs are too big for that hole. And then on top of that goes our airlock with some water in there so that all of the carbon dioxide gases can escape and nothing can get back in. Fermenter, stock pot, thermometer, grain and hops bags. So usually when you buy these kits, they come with, with bits and pieces. The mangrove jacks one that I had out before was great because it comes with all of the bottles that you'll need for bottling up. It also comes with a hydrometer. Ah, where's the hydrometer? Back in a sec. Here's our hydrometer. And this is a measuring cylinder that I've just bought off Amazon. It's 100 mils, so it holds enough liquid in there to float the hydrometer uh, and get, it, get a, a decent reading off it. We do this at the end of the boil, and we do this at the end of fermentation, and we take those two numbers and we press the, put them into a calculator, and the calculator spits out the amount of alcohol in the beer. So that's what that's used for. Again, the Mangrove Jacks kit came with it. This kit didn't come with it. If, you, if you're going to buy, I bought this kit for a reason, and if you watch the video on the unboxing, you'll see why. I won't go into details now. But get yourself a kit that does have a hydrometer in it because it's handy to know how strong your beer is. So that's it, as far as equipment goes. That's all the equipment that you need. A stock pot, a fermenter, a thermometer, any type of thermometer will do, bung and airlock, hydrometer, cleaning solutions.
But what about ingredients? What ingredients do you need once you start on all grain brewing? Well, simple. This is more than I, you would normally use for an all grain brew, okay? You've got a bag with your cracked grains in it. That's your grist. That's going into the grain bag and that's going to be mashed. Once we take it out, there are our hops. These are SARS hops. There are dozens and dozens of varieties of hops and each of them give you a slightly different flavour profile and some of them are stylistic. There are some hops that, for example, EKG hops, East Kent Goldings, I associate with Guinness and dark beers. That's the hops that I like to use for, for those styles. Uh, Citra, I like to use on my smash beers, so single malt and single hop. Um, they're a, a type of session beer that are really easy to make because you only need one type of grain and one packet of hops, and that does you for your entire brew. So hops, malt. Now, I've got a few extra things here because the style of beer that I'm making with this, it says plum sour on there, but it's actually going to be a mango sour. I changed my mind this morning. So I've got some mango chips that I'm going to break up into either small pieces or crumb maybe, and, and they're going in there with the wort. Now because I'm putting them in there, I'm also using some pectic enzyme to break down the, the fruit basically. It breaks, breaks the fruit down and lets a lot more of that flavor out. And last but not least, the magic little beasties that turn sugar into alcohol for us, our yeast. And this is a Belgian sour mix. And because I'm doing mango sour, I'm using this type of yeast. Again, same as hops. There are a lot of different types of yeasts. You've got your very clean, very stylistic, very common yeast like USO5. Uh, which is a, a US style yeast, and you've got SO4, um, which is a, an English style yeast. You've got Mexican lager yeast, you've got farmhouse yeast, you've got, uh, oh, I can't even think off the top of my head at the moment, but there are a lot of different types of yeast. Again, they go with the beer that you're making. For a start, because I'm making this style of beer, that's the type of yeast I will use. Otherwise, if I'm just making a very plain style of beer uh, or my porter, I use a USO5 on it. And that just comes in a packet. You cut the packet open and tip it in. This one, they've just changed their packaging. Packaging. I suppose you're gonna hear those cockatoos. Yeah, they've just changed their packaging so that you don't have to cut the packet open anymore. It's got this handy little lid on it. We'll see how that goes and if I manage not to make a mess. So that's it. To make a very basic brew with, a very, with some very basic equipment, some things you may have sitting around the house already. Oh, the other ingredient that I didn't show you is this. Completely optional. This is how I make low carb beers. It's called Delta Zyme. And you put it into your fermenter and it breaks down long chain sugars because yeast only like one or two glucose molecules to break down. Anything beyond that is a bit, bit hard for them to get around. Uh, so the Delta Zyme turns those longer chain sugars into short chain sugars that the yeast can consume. So you end up with a very dry style of beer, but no carbs or low carbs anyway, very low carb. And I particularly like that with the Mexican lager that I make that makes that a very nice crisp lager. But again, as I say, completely optional. You don't need to be using this. You don't need to be using this. You can just use ah, bread yeast. It's perfectly acceptable to brew with bread yeast. They're all, all yeasts are, apart from lager yeast, lager yeast is a, a, a slightly different strain of yeast, but most yeast that you will use are Saccharomyces, Cerveza. I know it sounds like the Mexican word for, for beer, which is cerveza, um, but I can never remember the exact spelling. But they're all the same species of yeast. 
they've just been extracted over the years because, for example, yeah, Kavike yeast, um, they noticed that the, the Kavike yeast would withstand much higher fermenting temperatures and get through the, the sugars in a much shorter time. So they've promoted that strain and they've bred it and now you can buy just that strain of yeast. This one, the Belgian sour, throws sour flavours or what are called esters into your beer so that you get that tart flavour from a sour. And the Mexican lager yeast gives it that fairly typical Corona style lager flavour. So a lot for us to, to review in the future and I, I, I am going to do um, videos just on different types of yeast and their use on different hops and how they're used, different styles. And then on some of these additives as well that we can put into our beers just to make them clearer, make them crisper, uh, get more flavour into them, uh, make them cleaner style. There's a lot of different stuff that you can do once you start looking into this fascinating hobby of brewing. But for us, oh, no, there is one more thing I wanted to show you, which is just a, a slightly different style of fermenter to this. This is my 30 litre all rounder. It comes with a lid and that lid can take this screw on fitting for the airlock to go into. But you can also use it for pressure fermenting, which is something that I've been experimenting with over the last six months or so, uh, particularly with lagers to get them a lot cleaner. You, you tend to get a much cleaner style of beer when you ferment under pressure. But this is just a larger version of this. It's a little bit more expensive than that, but all it is is a bigger fermenter. You can fit more volume into it, obviously, I'm not going to fill it up from this stock pot. It'll take, well, it, it holds 30 litres. I would never go beyond about 25 or 26 with it, especially if I'm expecting a fairly active fermentation. But it's, again, just a different style. Um, if you take a look at the cleaning video that I did, you'll see a different style of fermenter in there, which is just a round cylindrical water carrier. Uh, that I got from Bunnings. I just drilled a hole in the lid for the, for the airlock to go into. All a fermenter has to be is a fairly airtight container that you can put an airlock on to allow those gases to escape. Obviously, there are other things that, that you need to take into account with it as well. Like you don't want any scratches or sharp edges on the inside where bacteria or wild yeast can hide and spoil your beer. But apart from that, yeah, pretty much anything. Ah, hang on, I've just cleaned out another fermenter that I can show you. Okay, so this is another style of fermenter. It's called a carboy or a demijohn. And this bung goes in the top of it. The airlock goes in there like that. And the reason I have this out is I'm shooting a mead making video this afternoon. So I'm just getting two of these out to clean them so that I can make 10 litres of mead. But this is one of the first fermenters that I bought because the very first fermenting that I did was actually mead. It wasn't beer. I didn't get into beer until after the mead. So I, I tend to use these for mead because I make mead in five litre batches. Um, even if I'm making 10 litres of mead, I'll make it in two five litre batches just because this is a bit too big uh, for mead. I don't go through. I don't drink nearly as much meat as I do beer. Meat is nice in winter, so it's coming up to winter now. But I'm also going to enter this mead into the local ag show um, and, and see how well I can do there. And that's it. That's all there is to fermenting. It's one of the simplest hobbies and one of the most rewarding. It, it is rewarding in that when you do make a very good batch and the porter that I've just put out into the, into the uh, kegerator is very good and it cleared up nicely yesterday. So I'm very happy with that, but it's very rewarding when you make something like that 
and you say, well, I did that. You know, I didn't go down and buy it. I, well, I did. I bought $20 worth of ingredients and made $150 worth of beer. But that's it. I'm going to wrap that up now. Very simple equipment, very cheap equipment. Some things you may have lying around the house already in order to get into this fantastic hobby, which is brewing. So just remember to like, comment and subscribe to the channel. That helps us out a lot, helps get our videos out there to be seen. Check us out on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and TikTok. And stay tuned because there is a lot more content to come. Cheers.